from a, the, the pandemic from a biblical viewpoint, from what's going on, because many folk know what's happening, they don't know why it's happening. And only the scriptures can reveal that to us in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Uh, you know, the darkness is getting darker. Uh, and I read this out of, uh, I think I said to you recently that um, what's going on in our schools with sex education for children isn't just for this country. It's going on all, way, all around the world. And it comes from the WHO. It comes from the United Nations. And uh, uh, they're, they're teaching four-year-olds and five-year-olds masturbation and all kinds of horrendous things in this curriculum. And people think you're making it up. Well, it's actually in the newspaper now. The Daily Mail picked it up and the Daily Telegraph were the only two newspapers that picked this up. Let me read some of this to you. Fewer over sex education for under fours. The World Health Organization has been urged to withdraw disturbing guidance to schools about sexuality education for children under four. Infants should ask about sexuality and explore gender identities, the report from policy makers across Europe says. It also supports giving them information about enjoyment and pleasure when touching one's own body and early childhood masturbation, but campaigners want it banned. It was consulted by Welsh ministers for a mandatory sexual education syllabus in their schools last year, although they said they did not endorse it. You know, but MPs are standing up against it. The Safe Schools Alliance said it was experimental, unscientific, and appears to be aligned to the work of unethical individuals and organisations, including those promoting the acceptance of pedophilia. The UK government said it did not agree with the guidance. We need to pray against it, folks, don't we? But if there's anything that tells me that we're in the end times, it's this. It's happening. And it's happening to our children. You know? It's happening in our schools. And what they're relying is they're relying on people not wanting to rock the boat. They're relying on people not wanting to make a stand. You know? But I think if this continues, you're going to see a mass exodus of children out of the schools. <coughs> they're going to be homeschooled. People don't want their children. We, when we ran a, a, a Christian <coughs> school um, in Reading, for about 12 years. Uh, some people sent their children to the school who weren't Christians, but they, they were very unhappy with what the kids were being taught in school. And, and they wanted a Christian education. They wanted those principles taught to their kids, even though they didn't necessarily embrace them themselves. Do you see that? Many, when we went door knocking in Whitney and Reading, many people would say to us, oh, I used to go to your church when I was a child. I used to go to Sunday school. Many parents sent their kids to Sunday school, didn't they? My parents did. I was packed off to Sunday school. Wasn't allowed to play outside the front gate, etc. You know? And, uh, and I, I thank God for that, that, st that, that standing, you know, because the, the Lord draws on that later on in life, doesn't he? Those things, those foundations that are laid early in our life. The, the Christian assemblies at school, which they've now cancelled, haven't they? There are no, there's no reading of the word now in our assemblies. There's no Christian assembly. There's no hymns sung anymore at the beginning of the day in school. And it's so tragic. And now they're saying one in ten is confused about their sexual identity. One in ten children believe they are born in the wrong body. One in ten. It's horrendous. And it's all being taught to them. It's being taught to them from our schools. So the Bible says, you know, there's going to be a time when they'll call darkness light and light darkness. They'll call good evil and evil good. They'll call bitter sweet and sweet bitter. I believe we're living in those days, folks. We're living in those days. And uh, I think uh, we need to realise that I, I was trying to... The, the, the problem is, you see, the world says that man is basically bad, but he does good things. Whereas the Bible says man is basically... The world says that man is... The world says that man is basically good and does bad things. But the Bible says man is basically bad and tries to do good things. There's something wrong with the heart of man. That's what the Bible says. And so though we're, we wrestle not, as I read from the, the scriptures last night uh, to the group at the farm, you know, Apostle Paul says we wrestle not against flesh. I said this is a, a spiritual war, really. It's a religious war. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but principality is and powers, hosts of darkness in heavenly places. And of course, you know, I said, well, how did we get caught up in this war? You know, how did we get caught up in this battle in the heavenlies here, in, 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 in this spiritual war? And, I, and of course, I said that you have to go back before time began. You have to go back 
and I, and I took them back to uh, the heavenlies before time began when uh, Lucifer, the most beautiful thing God had created, challenged God and uh, took on God and him and a third of the realm of the angels were thrown out of heaven to earth. And so the battle continues. But I want to say to you that, that though the bad is bad, the problem is the good ain't that good. You know what I'm saying? The bad is bad, but the good ain't that good. Yeah. And so you can, you can tear down this government, you, 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 can, you, you can start your own political party, you can do whatever you want that all the freedom marchers want to do. But because the heart of man is fallen, you're going to end up down the road in the same place you're in now. That's the issue. Unless something happens, unless the heart of man is changed. See, that's why Jesus said we must be born again. You know, and if we don't understand that, that the, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. True. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. That's the issue. The scriptures have a lot to say about the heart. Salvation, Romans 10:10, 10, 10, comes through believing with your heart, not your head. Yeah. Salvation comes through believing with your heart and confessing with your mouth. Am I switched on, Mike, by the way? Yeah. Do I need to switch this on? It's on. You switch it on. <laughs> you know, the, the head might think salvation is a good thing and embrace its reasoning and its theology, but it will not be enough to save you or change you. That's the issue. Lots of people make an intellectual assent to the gospel because they think, well, these are good principles. I think we should live by these principles. You know, they're good principles. Let's live by these. Well, that's all very well and good, but it's not enough to change you. It's not enough to change the way you think and change the way you act. For the gospel is a spiritual operation where he takes out the heart of stone and replaces it, he says, with the heart of flesh. So how do I know if my heart of stone has been replaced? Big question. How do I know if my heart of stone has been replaced? Well, the scripture tells us out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. A person's mouth will tell you if God has done that work of redemption. How do they talk? Are they telling smutty jokes? Do they use blasphemy? Do they use bad words? Do they use swear words? What's their talk like? You see, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. We should know who's born again by what comes out of their mouth. What comes out of your mouth? Hello? You can be sick in the body. You can be sick in the mind. We hear a lot about mental health today, don't we? You know, mental health. So much about mental health. But there's a deeper sickness the scriptures talk about. And that's of the heart. It's a sickness in the heart. And we have to get hold of this. Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred means put on hold, makes the heart sick. Hope put on hold, it means disappointment. Disappointment makes the heart sick. And of course that sick heart's going to affect your body in some way. Maybe, maybe it's um, uh, high blood pressure, maybe it's, it's other illnesses, maybe it's, you know, all kinds of things come from a sick heart. Proverbs 4.23, we have to guard our hearts from out of it, spring the issues of life. And I want to say to you this evening, Maybe the issues you're battling with might be a result of a wrong heart or a sick heart. Maybe the issues you've been battling with all your life come from the, a wrong heart or a sick heart. And you need to go back to book. You need to go back to basics. You need to check if you've got it right. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety in the heart of man changes, causes depression. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. But a good word makes it glad. Mm. Our, our words have a powerful effect on people. On our lives, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, the scripture says. We need to confess that word to ourselves out loud. Let ourselves hear the prophetic word of God. Philippians 4, verse 7. The peace of God starts in the heart and ends up in the mind. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard what first? Your heart. And then your mind in Christ Jesus. Here first, here second. We, we need to get hold of that. You see, the, 
the key to most mental health issues is the heart, <coughs> not the mind. That's the, that's, that's the biggie. Psychology might help you think differently, but not to live differently. Do you see that? It can only, it can only go so far. Psychology can only go so far. Psychology might reveal to you why you're depressed, why you feel differently, why you think you're gender confused, why you think you're in the wrong body. But it can't change anything. There's no pill for that, is there? No. Take this pill three times a day and you'll feel like a man instead of a woman. It's a nonsense, isn't it? But the Word of God can sort it out. The Word of God can sort it out. Male and female, he made them. And listen, Eve was cloned from Adam. She wasn't made from the dust like Adam was. She was cloned from Adam's side. She wasn't cloned from his head to be over, his, to be over him. She wasn't cloned for his feet to be under him. She was cloned from his side to be by his side. Hallelujah. I thank God for my wife who's been by my side for all these years in ministry. You know, when I'm there ministering to people, praying for people and casting out demons, my wife's there saying amen. Praise God, and a lot more sometimes. <laughs> Which is so important. Proverbs 23, 7. For as a man thinks in his way, in his heart, not his head, you think it would say in your head. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So is he. Not in your head. And my question to you this evening is, how do you think? How do you think? <clears throat> Romans 2.15 tells us it's our thoughts that accuse us or excuse us on the day of judgment. Have you ever thought about that? It's our thoughts that excuse us or accuse us on the day of judgment. You see, it's not what we say in public, but what we think about in private. That's the issue. That matters because that's the real us. What we think about in private is the real us. I can stand up here and say anything to you. And you might think, oh, wow, well, you know, Nigel's got it all together. But if I go into that house and, and switch on uh, pornography, you're not going to know that, are you? But God's going to see it. God's going to see it. <clears throat> and so we have to make sure we dealt with the flesh. We've dealt with the... I, I mentioned last night that I believe behind every sin is a demonic power. And if you embrace that sin enough, that demonic power enters your life. And then you move from desire, you desire to get drunk, you desire to watch pornography, you desire to do drugs, you desire to lose your temper, you desire to gamble, to compulsion. You're compelled to watch pornography. You're compelled to do drugs. You're compelled to lose your temper. You're compelled to gamble. You're not in control anymore. Something invisible is in control of you. And that's when I get a phone call. Can you help? And we see many, many a captive set free. There's no pill for this, folks. There's no medication for it, except the Word of God. And we need to be able to administer it. We need to be able to know how to administer freedom. Hallelujah. The Word of God is living and powerful, it says, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing bone from marrow, soul from spirit, and even unto discerning the innermost thoughts of what? Where thoughts come from? The heart. Doesn't, the heart. It doesn't say the mind. Discerning the innermost thoughts of the heart. That's what the Word of God does. You see, and that, that's the problem. <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, 9. Man's heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Man's heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Mm. And that's why we have to deal with the heart. Mm. Now, in 1 Samuel 13, 14, and Acts 13.22 uh, An amazing statement is made by God. And this is something I want to look into because if we can understand this, we can get a hold of this. 
You see, th this is uh, for our learning, this is for our understanding, and so we can say, Lord, how does that apply to me? You see, God makes an amazing statement about David, about King David. He says that he is a man after his own heart. 13, 22. And when he had removed him, he raised him. Uh, 13, 22, there we are. When he had raised him, uh, he removed him. He raised him from David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. That's a powerful statement. Because David committed adultery and he committed murder. David failed in the flesh big time. And yet God considers him a man after his own heart. So if you think that you can't make it to God, if you think your life is so bad that you've blown it, that's not the case. The Apostle Paul was a murderer. He stood by while Christians were tortured and murdered. And he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But you see, God changed the man. Completely. Totally. And God's in the life-changing business. He's in, he's in the name-changing business. He changed it from Saul to Paul. He'll change your name. He's into the life-changing business. Changed my life dramatically. And it's in God's statement. I have found a man after my own heart who will do my will. David always wanted to do God's will. And honoured that which God honoured. Though Saul tried to kill David, knew numerous occasions, David twice, when he had opportunity to kill Saul, wouldn't touch God's anointing. The same with his treacherous son, Absalom. Though he sought to kill David and steal the throne, when Absalom was uh, killed, David did not rejoice, but mourned his loss. Even though Absalom defiled his house by putting up a tent on the palace roof, and defiling all his concubines in front of Israel. But David wept. He mourned him so much that they had to rebuke him and say, you need to get a grip and come and leave Israel because people think you're a wimp. You know, you're getting soft. But he was cut to the quick by this, you see. Though David's love of the Lord was sincere, his flesh was weak. He saw another man's wife bailing from his roof terrace and sent for her and committed adultery with Bathsheba. Then sent her husband, Uriah the Hittite, to the front line during battle to be killed. And of course, Bathsheba fell pregnant with a son. And God took the life of Bathsheba's son, God's David's son, because of this terrible sin. And he was conceived in adultery I'll read this to you out of... Um, I, I, I'd like to... I felt that tonight, as I was reading some of this, I, I, I felt we need to uh, make some confessions um, in the Scriptures and hear ourselves confess uh, some of the Word of God, which I'll, I'll take us through later on. Could somebody grab me a glass of water, please? Uh, 2 Samuel 12, 9 to 15. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil? So Nathan, God sends Nathan the prophet to David to inform him of God's judgment. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, thank you, bless you. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. And that's exactly what happened. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, 
Because of this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also who is born to you shall surely die. Their nation departed to his house. So the judgment of God came upon David. I want to say that long before David took on Goliath, he proved God. We're, we're encouraged to prove God, not test God, but to prove him in our lives. Prove me now in this, he says, doesn't he? With finances, he says, prove me now in this, if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing in Malachi. And D David proved God in looking after his sheep. He took, on, uh, he took on lions with his bare hands and he took on bears and wrestled them and killed them to protect his sheep. So he knew that God was with him. He knew that God was with him and he knew he would be with him against an uncircumcised Philistine. Hallelujah. You know, it, how can we get an insight into David's heart? Well, I have to say, the Psalms show us David's heart. If we go to the Psalms, we begin to see the heart of David. Psalm 51 shows us how David was truly repentant towards God for his transgression. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. These are the sort of prayers we need to pray to God to get saved, amen? For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. People say you take nothing with you when you die. Well, they're wrong. You take your character with you. And you will stand before the Lord with your character. Not your personality. All our personalities are different. God broke the mould when he made you. There's not another person like you in the world, personality-wise. But our characters, he wants the same. He wants our characters to be like Jesus. He wants our characters to be identical. Are you with me? They're completely different to personality. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and then sinners shall be converted to you. You see, charity begins at home. People say, well, that's not a biblical concept. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. Proverbs tells us that a hard-working farmer must be the first to eat of the crop. So God's got to sort you out before you can sort anyone else out. Amen. He's got to sort your hardened heart out. He's got to clean up your mouth. He's got to sort your life out. Charity begins at home. When we're sorted, we can then begin to draw others to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Then, he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 26 shows us how truly thankful David was towards God for his redemption. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is before my eyes and I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with idolatrous mortals, nor will I go in with hypocrites. I have hated the assembly of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and tell 
of all your wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not gather my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands is a sinister scheme, and whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful to me. My foot stands in an even place. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The rather long Psalm 119 uh, shows us how David loved God's word. And it's this part, parts of this psalm I'd like uh, us to confess over ourselves this evening. As, um, as I, I'll read it out, perhaps you'd like to repeat it after me once I've, um, once I've quoted from it. Hallelujah. So, Psalm 119. I'll just pick out a, a, a few verses it said. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. For your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. And I will not be ashamed, and I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to, up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. I am a companion of all who fear you and those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth, and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O oh Lord, according to your word. I'd like to read these scriptures, and if you'd like to repeat them after me, do so. Uh, but uh, if, if you don't feel you want to, that's fine. Direct my steps by your word. My steps by your word. And let no iniquity have dominion over me. <laughs> Redeem me from the oppression of man. That I may keep your precepts. Revive me according to your word. The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. But my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word. As one who finds a great treasure... Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise. For you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word. For all your commandments are righteous. Let your hand become my help. For I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord. And your law is my delight. Let my soul live. And it shall praise you. And let your judgments help me. Hallelujah. Amen. Wonderful confessions, amen? We receive those by faith, Lord. 
Receive them, Father. Make them come true, O God, we pray. David honored his covenant with Jonathan, Saul's son, and asked if there was anyone remaining in Jonathan's line. There was a son who was crippled in both legs called Mephibosheth. Do you know what Mephibosheth means? It means useless in Hebrew. Imagine calling him as a child. Useless, where are you? Useless, I'm looking for you, useless. You know? How many of you have had parents say to you, you're useless? You know? You, 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 you'll, you'll never grow up to, to do anything. You see, these things can be a curse over our lives. David called for him and he said, what do you want with such a dead dog as I? He said to David. What do you want with such a dead dog as I? But he made a covenant with Jonathan and he wanted to honor, honor Jonathan's a seed. You see, the word says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And that's how Mephibosheth thought about himself. But David said, how many times? No, David said, just as David said to Mephibosheth, now from now on you will eat at the king's table. And so the Lord would say to you, no matter what's gone on in your past, if you've cried out to the Lord and you've asked him to come into your life and change the way you think, take out that heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. He says to you, come and eat at my table. You don't have to eat the crumbs from under the table. You can eat at the Lord's table, amen? But many of us don't, you see. Many of us don't. We, 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 don't, we hold back. We don't come forth. Though God called David to be king, his life was threatened by Saul. We need to get hold of this because, you know, it doesn't mean that because you become a Christian, life's going to be easy for you. In fact, all your problems start. All your problems start. Because you go from the, the back page of the Daily Down Under to the front page. The devil knows your name. And he comes, he, he starts to cause trouble in your life. Because before he wasn't too interested in you. You'd live your life, you'd die and go to hell. But now he knows he's lost you. The, the struggle starts when you start to seek truth. Boy, when I started to seek truth. I used to go to church and while I was in religion, the devil never bothered with me. I just looked at some lady in a silly hat. And uh, I just got lost in my thoughts. But when I started to seek the truth, then the devil started to rock my boat big time. I had as if I had God on one leg and the devil on the other. And he, he didn't want me to get saved. In fact, he tried to kill me in a car crash. And I hadn't made that decision, but he knew I was about to. And I was in my Lotus Esprit coming back from the airport and uh, a guy came out from my right, another one from my left, and I thought, could I make it between them? I, I put the pedal to the metal and I got through, but I hit a dip in the road. It threw me into a tree at 75 miles an hour. I've got a scar on my skull now where I hit this tree. The, 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 uh, the car disintegrated because it was fiberglass. I've got a picture of the steering wheel bent into a W. And they, the guys... Uh, uh, the, the fire brigade said, who's, who's ever in that ambulance must be dead, the state of this car. And, um, and I lay in hospital, and I knew I should be dead. And there was glass all in the bed. And uh, I don't know why they hadn't cleaned it out, but they hadn't. And I'd lost my memory. My, when I was dilated badly, uh, the pupil of the eye, they were going to send me to Oxford to a, a hospital there that dealt with brain injuries. And my mother came in. I didn't recognize her. And... Uh, uh, and she thought, well, that's it, you know, he's, he's done for. But I had enough, enough sense to know I should be dead. And I repented on my hospital bed. And I said, Lord, forgive me for my sin. I call upon your name. Come into my life and change me, Lord. Well, my dilated pupil went back to normal. My mother came in in the afternoon and I pretended I didn't recognize her, but by then I did. And uh, I said, who are you? Who are you? She said, oh, no. I said, oh, I know it's you, mother. <laughs> and then my twin brother came in. And uh, they said, well, I had to stay in hospital for checkups for some time. I said, no, I'm healed. I signed myself out. He said, well, you can't do that. I said, I am doing it. He said, well, you can't come back. I said, I won't be back. And God healed me. I signed myself out. I knew he'd called me to the gospel and um, I, was, uh, I was invited to a, a full gospel businessman's fellowship international and uh, the FGB and, uh, 
it, it's a, a group of uh, Christians. They came from the States and they hold uh, Christian meetings in hotels and they invite people who wouldn't come to a church to come to a dinner and they invite uh, Christian sportsmen, people who have a, a powerful testimony, who would draw a crowd to give their testimony. And these folk have an answer. Um, they hear a, a person's testimony about how they became a Christian. And then they make an altar. And many get And so I made my public confession there at that dinner. And that chapter they invited me back to. And I gave my own testimony of what happened to me. And I uh, made an altar call and saw a few folk come forward for salvation. And uh, ever since then, I've been preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. But um, God, God changed my life dramatically, filled me with the Holy Spirit at one of those meetings. This strange language came out of my mouth. And um, this friend who was with me thought I'd gone bonkers. But um, I thank the Lord that he filled me. And we all need an overflow, you see, because when the joy of the Lord comes on you so powerfully without our... What are you going to do? You've got to do something with it. You have to have an overflow. It comes out of your mouth. Hallelujah. If you'd uh, been in this room a couple of hours earlier, you would have uh, thought I was unhinged as I was leaping around and praising God. A bit like David in his underpants. Praise God. So I want to say this to you about David's life. In closing. Though God called David to be king... His life was threatened by Saul. He had to flee and dwell in caves. Saul tried to kill him on more than one occasion. Threw a spear at him and he ducked and it missed. Twice, I think, he, he tried to pierce him through with a spear. His son Absalom committed treason and announced himself king to steal the kingdom. David had to flee again for his life from Absalom. This is... You know, this is the man God anointed as king. And all these problems were happening to him. Then David's son, Odinajah, announced himself king, tried to steal the kingdom. So Bathsheba had to approach uh, the mother of Solomon, had to approach David on his deathbed to say that he's trying to steal the crown and you promised that Solomon would be king. So I want to say to you this, just because God has a plan doesn't mean everything always goes to plan, does it? The Bible tells us that the enemy does not come except, the enemy does not come except to rob, kill, and destroy. And so we're in a battle. As I read last night, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness, hosts of wickedness, in heavenly places. That's it, folks. And he warns us to put over on the full armor of God to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. And it says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. So David is a good example of a man who loved God but succumbed to the desires of the flesh. But he admitted his sin and truly sought forgiveness from God. Nevertheless, he was a man who demonstrated his faith, loved the Lord, and always sought his counsel in the love of God's law. I quoted from Jeremiah 17.10 earlier. Man's heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? The rest of that scripture says this. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Amen. I want us to sing a song. Change my heart. Oh God. Amen.
Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may it be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. Change our heart, Lord. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Yes, Lord, change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Oh, Holy Spirit's just fallen on me. Hallelujah. Change our hearts, Lord. Change my heart. Change it, Lord. Change it, Father. Make it. Make it new, Lord. Hallelujah. Change my heart. Only you can change us, Lord. Nobody else can. Yes, Lord, you are the potter, Lord. I am the clay. Make me and mold me. This is what. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever new. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Just with every eye closed now and head bowed, I want to ask you, have you prayed that prayer? Have you asked the Lord into your life? Have you just got dead religion? Do you know the Lord's taken out your heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh? Even those of you listening online tonight, I want to say, if you've never made that decision, I want you to raise your hand so I can see it. Let the Lord see it. If you want to make that decision for the Lord tonight and say, Lord, I want you to change my heart. Take out my heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. Do we all know where we're going? None of us want to hear Jesus say, Be gone from me, I never knew you. No, we say, I've cast out demons in the name, I've preached the gospel, I went to church, I read the Bible, I sang the songs, be gone from me, I never knew you. I tell you why that's such a horrendous scripture, because it's too late. That's why that's such a horrendous scripture. He can say it to you now, and you can change that, and allow him to know you. He didn't say, I didn't know about you. He says, I never knew you, which means I never had a relationship with you. It's not too late to change that. But if you hear him say that to you, then it's a done deal. You're eternally lost. Do we all know the Lord as our Savior? Don't leave this place without confessing Christ as your Savior. 
Don't turn off your PC tonight without confessing Christ as your Saviour. Asking him to come into your life and take out that heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. While we were singing that song, you are the potter, I am the clay. And the Lord is saying, there's one or two of you here who keep riddling off the potter's wheel. The Lord gets his thumbs into you to bring up the clay, but you wriggle off the potter's wheel. And he's saying, you need to stay put and let me do the work. You need to stay put and let me do the work, the Lord says. Thank you, Lord. Do that work in us, O oh God. Do that work in me, Lord. Change us, O oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, O oh God. Line upon line, precept upon precept, change us into your likeness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.